And now another episode of Midnight Cab. Today, a secretive old Italian woman with blood on her hands draws Walker into the mystery of the woman in black. Walker. Walker, where are you anyway? Hello. Hello. Don't sound so excited. I'm tired. No kidding. You got a pickup at 428 Young. Ring the top buzzer. Thank you. Go to bed. I can't until midnight. If you wait until midnight, these mice will be dragging you down a road in a pumpkin. Mm, that's okay. Krista. Jeez. She sounds stoned. September 5th. Krista is suffering from sleep deprivation. Maybe I should join a support group. My name is Walker Devereaux, and I'm the husband of a workaholic. She leaves the house at 7.30. She's designing a new computer system, while Mr. Piatelli, who is just back from convalescing in Vermont, hides in his office. The system apparently is terrific. The only problem is it has to be inputted by Mr. Piatelli and his wonder mechanic, Joe Smart. Garbage in, garbage out. Meanwhile, she picks up her child Martha at the babysitter's and arrives home at 6. I have the supper on, more or less, and then I bathe Martha and get her ready for bed, more or less. She complains about the quality of the food and the mess in the kitchen, then does paperwork until she begins to dispatch from the house from 8 to midnight. When I arrive home at 5 in the morning from a hard night of driving cab, she's asleep. When I flop into bed, she flops out, neatly avoiding any bodily contact, picks up her crutches and proceeds to the bathroom. I fall asleep. And the next time I see her, it's supper, and so on, and so forth. Please, help me. What's this stuff? Uh, mixed vegetables. Oh. Well, why don't you put it instead of the stuff out of a can? It's a lot better. I'll think about it. So, anyway, Alfonso is slowly coming around to the idea that we could control costs much more effectively if we integrate this really neat budget program I found. But we need code and input inventory, so it means we have to hire someone, at least part-time. Because Joe refuses to wash his hands, and there's grease all over the terminal, and besides, he doesn't know what he's doing anyway. Garbage, garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. But Alfonso's slowly coming around. He kind of pokes at the keys with a pencil. And I think he likes me being around the office again. We had a kind of meeting. I mean, he actually sat me down. Sit down. Sit down. Thanks. So, how you doing, anyway? Fine. How are you doing? Uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. It never happened. I don't even know how to spell the word. Heroin? Thanks. You're doing great, Alfonso. Just keep doing everything the doctors tell you, okay? Yeah, so, look, uh, you own 51% of the shares of this business because your old man gave them to you, right? Yes. But I run the day-to-day -day operations. I make the decisions, well, except for capital items and distributions of profits, right? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I need a manager. I mean, since Jack Millen disappeared on me. And so, well... You know, anyway, you're it. I, I am? I'm it? Oh, Alfonso, am I? Really? I'm the manager? Oh, Alfonso. You're not just doing this, are you? Because my father... No, 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 no. no. I, I, I'm doing it because you're a hard worker. And you're the best one for the job. You always have been the best one, you know. Yes, I am. I always do that. <laughs> this is just really... It's, it's just worked out really, really good. Yeah. I'm not paying you, though. What? You're the majority owner. Why should I pay you? You'll get it the other end. But I want my manager's salary now. If I'm going to work my buns off... Hey, I, I work my buns off. Nobody pays me. What are you talking about? You give yourself a monthly draw. You change the amount all the time. It's ridiculous. How can I budget? You can't run a company that way. I run this company 30 years that way. And I want to manage your salary. All right, all right. Hey, get out of here. This meeting's over. You big dope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're negotiating. Yeah? He's going to make me the manager, Walker. He really is. He said so. And he's going to pay me more. We haven't quite decided how much yet. But it'll have to be quite a bit because of 
the responsibility. Not to mention the hours. But I'll be the manager, Walker. Can you beat that? For once, I'll be making the decisions. Of course, if everything screws up, I'll get the blame. But I won't. Do you, do you think the guys will be okay? I mean, me scheduling them and firing and hiring and, like, being the manager? Absolutely. They'll think you're the greatest. They'll throw you a beer bash. <laughs> we think you're the greatest, too, don't we, Martha? Martha would make a speech, but her mouth and nose are plugged with applesauce at the moment. <laughs> God, there, sweetie. Let mommy wait. This is like great. Congratulations. Funny how things work out. I was going to be a great writer. I was going to sit in dark blues clubs all night and talk to poets. I was going to ramble down the streets of all the exotic cities in the world, dropping off masterpieces to publishers along the way. I'll be 22 next month. Nothing's happening to me. Nothing. Well, something almost did. But it was the wrong something. Jake's. She was unpublished, too. As wispy and beautiful as a girl in a Modigliani painting. I met her at the beginning of the summer. Every Tuesday afternoon, we'd sit in this grubby little restaurant and, well, at first... We just talked about already. You know one of the parts I like best? The old lady dressed in black at Mass. No, oh, right. Finally, no one else was left to come to Mass at all. Everyone else had disappeared, just her and the young priest. Yeah. And she just sits there and stares up at him. Such an accusatory stare. And he knows that she's blaming him for everyone's disappearance and for the monsters in the woods. The monsters dragging themselves out of the sea. Yeah. She knows him. Better than he knows himself. She knows he's guilty of murder somehow. He still thinks of himself as just a nice guy. It's allegorical. And then, after a while, those afternoons, we stopped talking about our writing and started talking mostly about ourselves. Then we stopped that, too, and just kind of sat there and looked at each other. And longed. Longed for each other. Touch. Smell, embrace. Oh, jeez. But I couldn't. Even though my brain wasn't working all that clearly, I knew one thing. Just because my life wasn't working out the way I wanted and I was, like, feeling sorry for myself, this was not a bright thing to do. Chaos. Disaster. It would have killed Krista if she'd found out, and that would have killed me, too. I said a final goodbye to Jiggs and walked away. And then, jeez, huge waves of relief. I felt like I'd just dodged a silver bullet. I felt like kissing our old car, the front door to the house. Paradise regained, normality. And I loved Krista even more, and I loved Martha even more. And I missed Jake's. Walker, where are you now? It's 11 o'clock, isn't it? I'm sitting in front of Majestic Donuts, having my coffee in an orange cooler. So predictable. Yeah, I know. You have a pickup just down the street, corner of Parliament and Carlton, the southwest corner. Oh, Good evening, ladies. Anna, Anna, in, in, come on. Uh, are you the ones who phoned for a cab? We'll talk. Right. Oh, well, I guess you are. I don't want it. Oh, God. Toronto, too big. Yeah, well, it's kind of. Cookie, this address. Oh, okay, no problem. Is um she all right? God is with her. Anna, you quiet. Please now. I've had some weird people in the back of my cab, but these two old ladies were like the champs. One just huddled in the corner, whimpering, and the other one, every time I glanced into the rearview mirror, she fixed me with a wide, fierce smile like she was daring me to say something. I could hardly see the first one, just a glimpse of pasty white face beneath a black scarf and white hands or white gloves fluttering against the front of her black cloth coat like trembling birds. She continued to moan, and then, I swear, I saw the other one reach over and twist her ear to make her shut up. 
Okay, St. Peter's Born Bathurst. This is where you wanted to go, right? Oh, yeah. A good boy. Uh, yeah, look, I can wait if, like, she's not feeling well in case you need to go to a doctor or something. Oh, my sister. Happy. Capish? She sees Blessed Virgin. Cry, happy. Yeah? Come. Come. Anna. With that, she grabbed the other old woman by the sleeve and dragged her out of the cab, turned back, tossed me a crumpled up 20 and... <laughs> I watched them hurry through the open iron gates towards the steps and the large wooden doors of St. Peter's Church, locked and empty now. It was almost midnight. Then they turned and disappeared into the dark around the side of the building. I got out of the cab, stood on the sidewalk for a moment. It was upsetting watching the one old woman manhandle the other like that. And I hadn't said a thing. And now they were gone. The church. Old women in black. Even the kind of formless dread I was beginning to feel, it was all vaguely familiar. Like I was still writing my novel. And I felt... impotent. About my unsuccessful writing, about having to walk away from jigs, and now not even being able to help out an old woman. I got back in the cab and drove away. Hi. Hi. Is your cab free? Can you take me to the corner of... Oh, come on. Come on what? I'm not getting in here. Why don't you clean up your back seat once in a while? What, what are you talking about? That. What is that? Oh, God. No thanks. Lying on the seat and on the floor were two long white gauze bandages, and on each one, circles of glistening blood. Not her white hands against her black coat, then. Not white gloves, but bandages. That's why she was moaning. And near the end of one bandage, faintly, wavering, almost absorbed by the gauze, seven red numbers. Like finger painting. Like a call for help. I owe that old lady a phone call. That's what I was thinking to myself. I let her down once. I'm not going to let her down again. That's what I was thinking as I stood in that phone booth feeling like I was in the middle of a dream. Somebody. One. Twenty. Southern Street. Somebody help. Anna Calabini. Please. Say Carlo. Carlo. Get key. Please. A normal person would have just gone to the police and said, Check out 120 Sherburn Street. A normal person would not have driven down there. Somebody restless with himself and feeling kind of lost, though, might. 120 Sherburn turned out to be, well, kind of a flop house. A run-down four-story hotel with plastic garbage bags on the steps, a sign that said we rent rooms by the hour, and at one in the morning, a wide-open front door. See you there, my man. Yeah. So where's the girlfriend? Well, bring her on in, my man. Don't be I shy. I don't have a girlfriend. Yeah? You want one? No. Yeah? So? Whatever. How long you want the room? I'm looking for um, Anna Cabertini. Oh. Hey, you're Carlo, eh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got a key for you, man. Uh, here's somewhere. Oh, well, there you go. Thanks. The pleasure is all yours. Hey. All right. I left the desk clerk dressed in camouflage reading his Soldiers of Fortune magazine and climbed up the narrow dingy stairs to the third floor, pushed open a metal door and walked down a dank and shadowy hall to room 35. I was about to knock when I heard her, the old woman, talking to someone on the other side of the door. This is my son. After my tonight. I waited. Silence. Anna? It's me. 
the cab driver. Remember? Anna? The door swung open into a small room in darkness. I switched on a light. There was a single bed neatly made, a scratched-up bureau and chair, a threadbare carpet on the floor, an empty closet, and no one. No one at all. Anna? There was a book. Lying on the chair with a piece of torn newspaper between the pages, I picked it up, sat on the edge of the bed, and opened it at the mark. And a woman looked up at me from the page, and she was young, and her name was Gemma Galgani. And she had lived and died in Italy at the turn of the century, and she was holding the palms of her hands towards the camera, and in her palms, two round, blood-filled wounds. Stigmata spontaneous wounds of Christ on the hands and feet, and sometimes the lance wound in the chest and bleeding wounds on the forehead from the crown of thorns. The book was full of devout men and women displaying deep in their own flesh the open and bleeding wounds of Christ. Gemma Galgani had been made a saint. And now I felt like I had really fallen deep into my novel, even the title I'd given it, Other Worlds. So, the old woman in the cab, with hands bound and fluttering like white birds, was what? A stigmatic. That's why St. Peter's there? That's why her sister said, she's blessed by God. But if she was, why was she crying? Why didn't she want to go? And why was she asking for my help? Where was she? The telephone and answering machine were sitting on a small table beside the bed. I'd heard Anna's message when I'd called before, and I thought I'd heard her in that room not a moment ago, but now I had an idea. I know you are there. In my room. Oh, bless you, son. It's a mortal sin. Do you understand? My sister warns me and claims I am a chosen one of Christ. We go to the priest and say, a miracle. She wants gifts, money, but she warns me herself and makes me say it's a miracle. I am afraid for my soul. Pray for me. Come to St. Peter's tonight. Help me tell the Father I lie. Help me. I will see you and I will say, this is my son. After Mass. Tonight. The voice I'd heard, her voice in the room, had been on the machine. She'd called her own number as I was going up the stairs. She'd been watching me from somewhere. And the more I thought about the two old women calling for a cab just down the street from Majestic Donuts at 11 p.m., and the guy at the desk downstairs saying, The pleasure is all yours. My blood froze because I knew... 7.30 the next evening, I walked into St. Peter's just after Mass. Hello, Ben. Hi, Father. Oh, you missed Mass, I'm afraid. It's just over. Yeah, I know. That's okay. Is it? Well, next time. I don't mean like I intentionally missed it. I'll um, come back on Sunday. Terrific. Well, duty calls. Oh, Father. Yes? Yeah? Stigmata? What about her? I was just wondering, have you ever, like, seen a stigmatic in person? No. Not yet. I probably never will. It's very rare. It'd be quite something to see, though, wouldn't it? If it were genuine. It would shake you up. With that, he hurried past me and entered one of the confessionals at the back of the church where five older ladies, all in somber black clothes, were already lined up waiting for him. But none of them was Anna Cabertini. And then I saw her. 
in her long black coat and scarf. She was kneeling in one of the alcoves, reached out a slim hand to light a candle, and then she touched the feet of the Blessed Virgin who stood towering above her. And I stood up, and she glanced my way, got swiftly up off her knees, and hurried out the side door into the night. I let her go. I sat down in the pew again and waited a while, then, feeling angry, feeling like a fool, even feeling a little scared, I went back to 120 Sherburn Street. Are you there? Are you in there? The room was dark, except for the last faint light of day filtering around the blind on the window, and, deep in shadow, on the chair, the old woman in black sat and watched me. Hello, Jigs. Hello, Walker. What am I supposed to do? Applaud? Faint? It was a test. Let's dramatize his novel and see how long it takes him to get onto it. At least, that, that's what I told my friend. Of course, it wasn't exactly like your novel, was it, Walker? No. I don't know how to do monsters coming out of the woods, coming out of the sea. Jigs, why? Why? Maybe because I wanted to play around with you like you played with me. Make you feel as stupid as I felt. I didn't mean... Maybe I wanted to seduce you, Walker. You're very brave in your fiction... You're very bold in your make-believe world. But it's not inside your head now, is it? It's all around you. It's dangerous now. Jeez. You can do what you will with me now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have just stayed away from the first. I shouldn't have even, like, pretended I could be free. Well, yes, that... Would have been a good idea. Pretend. That's all it was, wasn't it? Pretense. Well, I thought... I don't know what I thought. I'm having a hard time holding my life together, Walker. Jakes, take it easy, okay? Come here. Look at me, Walker. Look. What do you see? A mad woman? No. It started off as a joke. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Told me. No, it didn't. Not for long. When I saw you at St. Peter's, the look you gave me, and me dressed up like a fool, I began to, like, lose things, you know? I, I couldn't, like, Hold things together. Everything went spinning. Spinning, you know? Come on, Jakes. Don't. I think I've hurt myself, Walker. What? I, I didn't mean to. I didn't. I really didn't. And she looked up at me, her beautiful face. Her eyes now glassy, unfocused, but she was suddenly blind. And her hands coming up off her dark lap like slow flowers blooming. And her wrists were running dark, this time with real blood. Jigs. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. AP Caps. Yes, sir. Okay, that'll be about uh, ten minutes. Thank you. Enrico. Enrico, where are you now? Oh, okay, you got to pick up at 452 College. Outside. Right. Is she going to be all right? Yeah. They're not deep. It's more like... Uh, now, the doctor said it's like a pay attention to me kind of thing. Oh, yeah? So let me, let me get this straight. She slit her wrist because you were friendly to her, and she took things the wrong way, 
and she felt bad. But there was nothing between you two, really. Is that right? I was um, attracted to her. I I was like being really stupid, trying to fool myself into thinking I could have everything I wanted. You and Martha and all we have and, like, even more. But I knew I couldn't, so I just said goodbye. And we weren't lovers or anything, and, and this is what happened. And... I don't know. I feel so rotten. Every way. Yeah, well, there must be something really wrong with me. I guess I should feel thankful that you really wanted to make love to someone else, and at the last moment you didn't. But somehow, that fails to thrill me, Walker. Thanks a lot. Oh, come on, Krista. You lousy, creepy son of a bastard. You know something? What bothers me most? I don't know what's going on in your head, Walker. I don't know anything about you. You answer it. Because... Because I'm going somewhere. I'm going out. I visited Jiggs once in the hospital. She said that it didn't really have anything to do with me. It had to do with her whole life. And that she was going to go away somewhere, start again. She looked fragile and pale. I didn't know what to say. I was afraid to say anything. I think I've seen her for the last time. The last of her. And Krista. Well, she hasn't killed me yet. I even caught her smiling at me the other day when I was reading to Martha. Of course, then she looked away. I don't know. I think we will get it back together again. I will get it back, I mean. Her trust. The Mystery of the Woman in Black was written by James W. Nichol. David Ferry was Walker. Jacqueline Samuda was Krista. Howard Jerome was Mr. Piatelli. Nikki Wadani was the first old woman. Stacey Mistician was the young woman. Michael Karuna was Slim. Thomas Hoff was the priest. And Stephanie Morgenstern was Jiggs. The recording engineer was Greg DeClude with sound effects by Matt Wilcott. Production assistant, Nina Callahan. Music was composed by Milan Kimlicka. Midnight Cab was produced and directed by Bill Howell. You can hear today's episode, The Mystery of the Woman in Black, again this Saturday night on CBC Radio, 6.30 in most of Canada, 7.30 in Atlantic Canada, 8 o'clock in Newfoundland. And here's Emmylou Harris with a song from her album, Wrecking Ball.